This is Thought in Motion, a series dedicated to the seminars of psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan. Today's video is part three of our introductory exploration of Seminar 5. In this video, we'll explore how clinical structures can be understood in relation to the graph, with a specific focus on obsessional neurosis, which constitutes the majority of Lacan's clinical commentary in this seminar. We'll also highlight the contrasting features of hysterical neurosis throughout. I left out a consideration of psychosis and perversion, as Lacan's comments are few when it concerns their application to the graph of desire and for the sake of keeping this video a bit more focused. It's important to note that this video is not a comprehensive overview of any clinical structures that are mentioned, and for that I recommend a book like Bruce Fink's A Clinical Introduction to Lacanian Psychoanalysis, or a video series by Derek Hook entitled Diagnosis in Lacan, both of which offer lucid and insightful analyses. Furthermore, while I am a clinician by profession, I don't claim to be an expert in the application of these structures to a clinical context, and I advise against drawing diagnostic conclusions about oneself from this video. Nevertheless, I do encourage us to consider a broader conception of these structures that extends beyond their clinical applications as they shed light on how the unconscious, which is a fundamentally social phenomenon, operates within societies and ideologies. This insight has been an important contribution by scholars like Slavoj Žižek, channels such as Theory Underground and others associated with the Young Zizekians are generating vital online conversation around this topic as well. Alternative considerations of the applicability of these clinical structures in light of social and political concerns have been taken up by figures like Deleuze and Guattari, which has its own online representatives, such as the blog essays and TikTok videos produced by Cody Without Organs, providing what I think is a lively and fruitful debate stimulated in part by these clinical structures developed by Lacan. Links to these references are provided in the description. In the exploration of neurosis, it's essential to acknowledge the crucial role of desire. This is due to the fact that the question of the other's desire and the inability to satisfy one's own desire is a prevalent theme in these cases. To summarize our previous discussions, desire serves as a marker of the individual's fundamental lack, as well as that of the big other. It arises from the prohibition of a mythical pleasure which is not necessarily grounded in history, but rather is a logical necessity in our becoming socialized and linguistically structured subjects. The two lacks, those of the subject and the other, are closely intertwined as the subject's desire is ultimately rooted in the desire of the other, with all the complexity and ambiguity that this notion entails. To appreciate how desire operates, it's helpful to refer to our common understanding of ourselves as agents in pursuit of tangible objects, demanding them from others and ourselves. I want pizza, I make an order for one. I want a job, I go out and get one. This understanding of ourselves delivers a semblance of control over our lives and feelings of frustration when our demands are not met. Desire, on the other hand, operates in the background of all this and becomes most apparent when our demands are seemingly met, but fail to provide the anticipated enjoyment. This indicates a misalignment between our conscious demands and something beyond them, a beyond that both propels us to make these demands, but also hinders our ability to experience complete satisfaction. This beyond of demand is what we refer to as desire, which is not simply a latent demand waiting to be fulfilled, Instead, it's an intrinsic dissatisfaction, leading to a fundamental question that lies at the core of subjectivity itself. According to Lacan, this dissatisfaction arises from the process of translating biological needs into language, which opens up a gap between our needs and the words used to articulate them. This gap is not just a matter of lacking sufficient vocabulary, but rather language transforms need into something else entirely. Moreover, those who give me those words to articulate need in demand are also emissaries of those in a position to authorize or veto my demands. 
To recognize this connection, my demands are no longer primarily concerned with basic needs, but rather with the presence of the provider. Consequently, the demand for the satisfaction of needs transforms into a demand for the other's constant presence, which we might call love. The other's absences and failures to offer unconditional love, however, produces a question that supersedes my demands. The question concerning what the other wants. A question that addresses the other's inexplicable absences. However, the question itself remains unresolved since the other's desires are always shrouded in mystery. For the other is also limited by language. And just as my speech is dependent on the other, the other is also dependent on a beyond of the other, which I, as a subject inquiring into the other's desire, must now take into consideration in my own inevitably futile attempts to resolve this question. If this beyond of the other is accounted for, that is, if I come to recognize not only my own lack, but also the lack that's in the other, my subjectivity will henceforth be located at the juncture of this indelible question of desire. As a result, I will discover that my desire is inextricably dependent on the other's desire. From this perspective, we can identify several prototypical strategies for dealing with the situation which produce neurotic subjects, provided we accept that there is no ideal strategy for coping with the situation. We're all engaged in a struggle that manifests itself in a symptomatic manner. I don't regard this so much as an overpathologizing as it is an elevation of our pathology to the dignity of our sublime singularity. From this claim, we can perceive psychoanalysis as a process that's not aimed at a cure, but instead entails a working through the question itself. First, we must recognize that there is a question underlying our conscious demands and that our symptomatic approaches, rooted in unconscious fantasy, attempt to evade or provide facile answers to it. Second, psychoanalysis can help us open up a space where new metaphors may be created, enabling our desires to be dislodged from their fixation on our evasive or narrow responses to the question. In cases of obsessional neurosis, the reliance of desire on the desire of the other creates a significant predicament, resulting in a profound contradiction in the relationship between the obsessional subject and their own desire. The subject indeed desires to desire, but not at the expense of being dependent on the other to sustain it. Therefore, the obsessional neurotic employs a contradictory strategy that strives to both undermine and reinforce the other. This contradiction manifests itself in various ways, first of which is the obsessional subject seeking to destroy the other's desire, which according to Lacan is equivalent to undoing the symbolic phallus, the signifier of lack that also represents the subject's dependence upon the other. This destruction, however, is not literal, but achieved by reducing the other to an object removed of all subjectivity. For instance, a male subject might objectify a woman by reducing her to a particular body part while disregarding her as a person. Similarly, in Lacan's discussion of the rat man, the child yells at the father, saying, you towel, you plate, thus attempting to reduce his father to an inanimate object. There is, according to Lacan, a veritable collision and collusion between the essential you of the other and this diminished effect of the introduction of signifiers into the human world which is called an object and especially an inert object, an object of exchange, of equivalences. It's about bringing the other down to the level of an object and destroying it. Thinking about this grammatically, the subject of the sentence, you, is identified with the direct object of the predicate. So it might be like saying, you, the other whom I'm addressing, are merely this object. You mean nothing to me other than as a mere means to my satisfaction. These examples are an expression of what Lacan has called previously founding speech, which establishes a relationship between the subject and the big other. The obsessional's founding speech contrasts with those examples Lacan provides in earlier seminars such as you are my master or you are my woman, which in those instances recognizes a dependence upon the other. It's essential to note that this founding speech need not be literal, audible utterances. In fact, most often it's not. 
Instead, it's more often expressed in symbolic acts, such as fantasies or behavior, which themselves are structured by signifiers, just like overt speeches. Important to bear in mind here is that the demand for the symbolic death of the other is also not a historical event that occurred in the subject's past, but a synchronous dimension of the subjective structure of the obsessional. This is illustrated in a version of the graph provided by Lacan in Seminar 5, where the other is not just an external person, but is also, and perhaps primarily, an internalized signifier. Lacan notes that the demand for death concerns the other as an internal manner, and it's experienced and lived in the subject on its return. For this reason, the subject is unable to harm the other without harming himself. Again, we can see this return on this graph here. In seeking to annihilate the other qua lacking, the obsessional subject seeks to maintain an image of themselves as a whole, their fantasy and vows being this whole non-lacking subject desiring a partial object that's not recognized as belonging to the other as other. This reformulation of fantasy leads Bruce Fink to rewrite the formula for fantasy as it pertains to the obsessional subject. This strategy manifests in various ways, including a fundamentally masturbatory sexual relation, since the obsessional subject relates to the other as an object rather than as a full subject. The hysterical subject also has a problematic relation to desire, but locates their desire at the level of the other's desire. To do this, they engage in strategies that refuse the other's satisfaction, maintaining the other as a lacking subject. The hysteric maintains the other's desire by making themselves into the object of the other's desire rather than seeking to turn the other into that object. As such, Fink has rewritten the hysterics fantasy as well as a formula wherein the subject identifies with an object in their desire to be the desire of the lacking other. Returning to the obsessional, let's now consider the other half of their contradictory strategy. The subject seeks to destroy the other while simultaneously preserving them at all costs, since the annihilation of the other would result in the destruction of the subject's own desire. As such, a profound ambiguity is on display in the obsessional subject who oscillates between strategies of retreat and approach, destruction and reconstitution. For this reason, Lacan likens the obsessional to Tantalus, who as a punishment was placed in a pool of water up to his chin but whenever he tried to drink from that water, it would recede out of reach. And similarly, he was surrounded by fruit trees, the branches of which would move out of his grasp when he reached out for some of the fruit. This is where we get the word tantalized, meaning to tease or torment another with something that is unattainable. Now, how does the obsessional preserve the other? According to Lacan, it's through the articulation of signifiers the very signifiers used to destroy the other. Lacan states, It is only with a particular articulation of signifiers that the obsessional subject manages to preserve the other, so much so that the effect of destruction is also the means by which he aspires to sustain it by virtue of the articulation of signifiers. And now how does the articulation of signifiers maintain the other? We should recall that the other as the locus of signifiers is not merely another lacking subject, but also what embodies the law that prohibits access to the object of desire. Thus, it is both a lack and the condition of possibility for lack. The repetition of signifiers originating from the other then maintains desire by rendering it forbidden, while also reassuring the subject of their own existence as a desiring subject. Consequently, the obsessional is firmly situated among signifiers, at home with them, as the signifier suffices to preserve the dimension of the other in him, but in a dimension that in some way is idolized. This contradictory strategy accounts for the verbal nature of obsessional symptoms. The obsessional maintains their sense of being alive so long as they are thinking. To not think is to risk death. They are, so to speak, an embodiment of the Cartesian cogito. Hence why elsewhere Lacan will claim that the fundamental question of the obsessional is, am I dead or alive? These repetitive and insistent signifiers, what Lacan refers to as the demands of the superego, reassure the subject that they are still alive, that they are still a desiring subject, 
while also facilitating a safe distance from the other's desire, which is rendered forbidden. In this instance, the superego delivers demands of prohibition rather than demands of enjoyment, though the latter may also be present in obsessive individuals as well who fear missing out on enjoyment as much as they fear experiencing it. For this reason, obsessional subjects have a proclivity to impose upon themselves arduous and punishing duties. These individuals may demonstrate exceptional aptitude in executing these tasks. Nevertheless, what is commonly observed is the phenomenon of what we might commonly call the workaholic, who struggles to disengage from work and enjoy leisurely activities, familial engagements, weekend breaks, vacations, and the like. Additionally, obsessional subjects frequently communicate their desires only via negation, wherein they express their aspirations as a form of denial. This verbalized negation can often manifest itself in the form of judgmental and moralistic language, either directed toward others or oneself. In hysterical neurosis, there is a greater consistency in their strategy to prop up the other. Moreover, their approach towards propping up the other is not characterized by incessant and repetitive verbalizations, rather it entails rendering themselves desirable by assuming an object-like status. Consequently, their aim is not to destroy the other, but to sacrifice their own desires, thereby destroying themselves as subjects. Nonetheless, the hysterics' desire persists in some expressed form as long as it remains associated with the desire of the other. This generates a split within the hysteric, leading to a simultaneous pursuit of becoming an object of the other's desire, while also seeking to merge their own desire with the desire of the other, resulting in a certain tension, not unlike those with obsessive tendencies, wherein the hysteric subject vacillates between destroying their own desire to become an object and maintaining their desire in identifying it with the other. This schism, in turn, can result in a form of fragmentation where aspects of an estranged desire manifest as bodily symptoms through the transition from fantasy to the imaginary realization of themselves. This vacillation between identifying with the object of desire and identifying with desire itself, insofar as it is the desire of the other, gives rise to the fundamental question Lacan claims to define the subjective structure of a hysteric. Am I a man or a woman? Or to put another way, am I the one who desires or am I the object of desire? Speaking of the imaginary, we next should consider how it functions for the obsessional subject as a support for their strategy in dealing with their enigmatic desire. For the obsessional, there is a relation with an idealized imaginary mother figure, often in the form of their spouse who becomes for the subject an object of love but not desire. This can lead to a classic scenario of the Madonna and whore archetype, which may be acted out in some cases or remain purely at the level of unconscious fantasy. It's exemplified in husbands who demonstrate minimal sexual desire for their wives and who only experience arousal through viewing pornography. And when desire is overtly displayed toward one's wife, it's only by fantasizing themselves being with someone else. It's this penchant for one to objectify the other and the other to objectify themselves that perhaps in part leads Lacan to claim there is no sexual relation. That is, there is a fundamental impediment for a sexual encounter to be between two fully recognized subjects. Another manifestation on the imaginary plane is the identification with the little other often a peer who is regarded as more distinguished, potent, and influential compared to oneself. This stronger, more powerful image of the subject, who is both rival and comrade, serves as a means of reinforcing the prohibition of the other by reminding the subject of their own insufficiency. In a previous video, I recounted a story regarding a close friend I met during graduate school with whom I shared an advisor and a close age proximity. We often humorously refer to each other as brothers from another mother. Yet my friend was undoubtedly superior to me both academically and socially. This kind of relationship prompted significant ambiguity as it required me to confront my own inadequacy and resulted in my employing tactics to dismantle the other, here embodied by our advisor, through a sequence of self-sabotaging maneuvers. The hysteric strategies also find support on the imaginary plane 
through a process of identifying with the little other. We find this phenomenon exemplified in the case of Dora, who identifies with Frau K, the wife of Herr K. Dora's identification with Frau K stems from the latter's embodiment as the object of the big other's desire, which in this instance is represented by Herr K. Nonetheless, it is important to note that this identification carries with it an erotic element as the hysteric's own desire becomes intertwined with Herr K's desire. As a result, Dora desires what he desires, which in this case is thought to be Frau K. The conclusion is only possible because of the structural parallels between Herr K and Dora's father, who is believed to be having an affair with Frau K. For Dora to maintain her agency as the desiring subject, rather than being reduced to a mere object of desire, it is necessary for Herr K's desire to be directed toward Frau K instead of Dora herself. This arrangement allows Dora to experience desire vicariously through Frau K and her father without sacrificing her own subjectivity. Furthermore, it helps to establish a certain equilibrium in the dynamic of Dora's relationship with her own father, who is also desiring Frau K. By both male figures desiring Frau K, Dora is able to resist the idea that it is herself who is an object of exchange in this relational dynamic. However, when Herr K declares his love for Dora instead of Frau K, it upsets this delicate balance and places Dora in the position of being identified as that object of exchange. This development is profoundly distressing for Dora and it ultimately leads to the emergence of her symptoms. If you found this video helpful and it's within your means, please consider making a super thank you tip. You can find the super thank you button below this video. If you wish to be an ongoing supporter of this channel, you can do so on Patreon where I offer video transcripts and unedited materials. The link is below. I wanted to thank the following for already supporting this channel on Patreon. You can also support this channel by liking and sharing this video and subscribing to my channel. I look forward to joining you next time when we begin lecture one of seminar five, engaging in more focused and shorter videos where we'll unpack some of the bigger ideas that we've covered in these last three videos. As always, thank you for watching and until next time, be well.